If we on? Can you hear me? I've got it on. I'm pretty sure I turned it on. It's on. Yes. They said they can hear it. They just need more tests. There we go. Getting better? All right. So good to see you. It's a delight to be here. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, see and work with Gary and Sherilyn again. You know, when we first joined Amazing Facts, this November it'll be 30 years. Uh, Gary was on the board when uh, they were evaluating this whippersnapper evangelist from California. And uh, so we worked together for years. And, and uh, I, I always told, I think I told him one time, you're going to be a conference president because he's got this good evangelist, got great leadership skills and vision, and just wonderful to see how God is blessing. We just saw your new conference office. That's a beautiful building. That's a big commitment. And uh, the Lord will bless you. They say, if you build it, they will come, right? So if you build a lot of conference offices, you'll fill them. But I'm not sure that's the mission, is it? <laughs> but no, that's still nice. I better change subjects. Anyway, <laughs> it is good to be with you. And um, I, this week, we're going to be opening the Word of God and talking about just some of the priorities of uh, being a Christian, being all in with Jesus. And... Uh, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about being set free. The Bible says that if the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. And we're going to be talking about uh, getting out of prison and going to the palace. Being a Christian is one of the greatest transitions that anybody could experience. Now, without looking at your Bible, if I was going to ask you to quote Ecclesiastes 4.14. Probably not one person here that would be able to do that. But it is a great verse. Let me read that for you. Ecclesiastes 4.14. One can indeed come out of prison to reign, even though born poor in the kingdom. Say it again. One can indeed come out of prison to reign, even though born poor in the kingdom. In many ways, this is the story of Scripture. You, you see it happening in history. I've been to South Africa, oh, I think, two or three times now, and, and uh, a remarkable story about how Nelson Mandela, who was, you know, he was battling against apartheid, this kind of basically racial seg segregation that was going on for eons there in the country. And he was in prison, Robben Island, 27 years in a little cell. And within a year of being released from prison, he was the president. Now, can you imagine, talk about a change of identity. Can you imagine spending all those years in a dank cell with scarcely the clothes on your back, and then all of a sudden, you've got a presidential airplane, helicopter, security force, palace, and the power of a, an empire. What a radical transformation. And he, he did not abuse that power. And he could have used it to try and get even with his enemies, and he said, no, we've got to make peace. Coming out of prison to reign, though born poor in the kingdom. I want to encourage you to take your Bibles, or your, you have a digital device with a Bible on it, and go to the last chapter in the book of Jeremiah. It ends in an interesting way. Jeremiah chapter 52, and we'll go to verse 31. Jeremiah 52, verse 31. By the way, this is also mentioned in um, the end of 2 Chronicles, almost verbatim. Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah. i got to stop there and explain what we're reading. The last good king of Judah was Josiah. And Josiah had three sons. He actually died a young man. He was like 39 when he was killed by the Egyptians in a battle. And one of the best kings. As a matter of fact, it says more good things about Josiah than it says about David. Um, just a godly, committed king from birth all through his life. But his kids didn't all turn out the same way. And uh, as the Babylonians conquered Egypt and they came to Israel and Judah and they said, you need to pay us tribute. 
and they said they would, but then they rebelled, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came down and he uh, attacked Jerusalem. Um, he didn't destroy the temple the first time. He carried away a number of captives along with Daniel. And he carried away the son of, Jehoiachin, of uh, Josiah. His name was Jehoiachin. Put him in prison because he had not paid his, um, the, the taxes, the tribute, and he'd rebelled against the king of Babylon. Put his uncle Zedekiah in charge. 11 years later, he did the same thing, but he was killed. But young Jehoiachin was in prison 37 years. That was the remainder of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Now, Babylonian prisons were probably not like some American prisons where you've got maybe television and ping pong and three meals a day and air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. Uh, I think it was probably pretty dank and discouraging. So can you imagine spending 37 years in that prison? And we're not sure, but evidently Daniel, who was still uh, very much alive and well during this time when Nebuchadnezzar died, he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar's son, Evil Merodach, who only reigned for one year. He was assassinated. But while he was in power, Daniel said, you know, our last king has been in your prison for 37 years, could you show him mercy? And it tells us that he did. This is what it says. In the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, now for you and me, that would be Christmas, huh? <laughs> what a present. That evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, he lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and he brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him, and he gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as far as his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon and a portion for each day until the day of his death all the days of his life. book of Jeremiah ends with the word, life. By the way, I was just reading a couple weeks ago, uh, they found a lot of documents from Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and they actually found a document that has the um, accounting of the provisions, the allowance for Jehoiachin. It's in the cuneiform tablets they found. You can look in the, it's in the British Museum. Isn't that something? So if you even doubt, you know, the Bible, a little detail like that they found. Now, can you imagine being Jehoiachin? You're in a prison, a Babylonian jail, 37 years. He was arrested as a young man. I think he was 22. 37 years. And then one day, off schedule, you hear the guard coming down the hall. You know that Nebuchadnezzar died and his son is now in charge and, and the guard is coming and he doesn't know. Usually if they don't come for meals, they might be coming for an execution or something. And then they put the key in the door and they say, come with us. He's going, uh-oh, what's up? Come with us. Can you give me a tip? Where am I going? The king wants to see you. That often wasn't good because he was thrown in jail. And instead of being destroyed, the king said, you've been there long enough. I'm going to set you free. Not only am I going to set you free, I'm going to give you an apartment in the palace. Not only am I going to give you an apartment in the palace, you can't wear those rags anymore. I'm going to give you a royal wardrobe. And you can't be eating the prison food anymore. I'm going to give you royal food. And you'll need some spending money, so I'm giving you a credit card. And even though I'm providing you an apartment and your own allowance, when I gather with my kings of the empire, I'm giving you a prominent seat at the table with the other kings. Talk about being seated with Christ in heavenly places. What a radical change that would be. I want to read it for you one more time so that you get all of the symbolism that's in here. He lifted up his head out of prison. And now, again, I'm in Jeremiah 52, and I'm going to verse 32. He spoke kindly to him. Does the Lord speak kindly to us? He gave him a more prominent seat than the kings who were with him in Babylon. 
So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments, probably weren't very nice, and he gave him what royal apparel. Does the Lord give us a new garment, a robe of righteousness? And he ate bread regularly. He doesn't eat the, the old prison bread anymore, but he's getting the royal bread. And he ate, eats bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him from the king. He says, I'm going to give you whatever you need for provision, a portion for every day. Give us this day our daily bread until the day of his death. You know what that means? Eternally, all of his life. What a radical change to go from being a hopeless, depressed prisoner to being elevated into the light of the palace. We just heard special music talking about a room with a view. And the Lord is going to give us a mansion he's prepared. Now, why would you want to be in prison if God is offering you a place in the palace? Those are the two destinies for every person be in the devil's dungeon or in Christ's castle. And the Bible is filled with stories of how God takes people from the prison and brings them to the palace. You've got the story of the Exodus. It's a story of God taking a nation of slaves and saving them from their prison, from the mire and the pits, and bringing them into a land flowing with milk and honey. What a radical change. And you know what's amazing, though, is after God saves them from slavery, he shows he loves them, delivers them from their bondage. And you know, it wasn't just any bondage. It says they were crying to God for their hard labor, and they were made to serve with rigor, and they were whipped, and they were oppressed. And when they even thought about freedom, the Pharaoh said, you not only need to make bricks, you've got to make them without straw, and you've got to keep up the same quota. It was miserable slavery. And then God... Not to mention they were killing the firstborn of the male children. And then Moses comes and says, let my people go. And instead of serving the Pharaoh who wants to destroy them and their children, now they're going to serve a God that loves them. He gives them food from heaven. He parts the Red Sea to save them. He gives them water from a rock. He delivers them from their enemies. He saves them from the serpents. Shows his love for them. When they say we're tired of the bread, he sends them quail which backfires eventually. But he answers their prayers. And you know what? They said, we ought to go back to Egypt. It's pretty tough here in the wilderness. Now, they're on their way to the promised land. You see, I just described, once you accept Christ, you have left, it's called justification, you've left Egypt, but you're not in heaven yet. You're going through the wilderness. But why would you want to go back? How many times have you and I met people that they get discouraged along the way and they want to go back? You know, uh, in the prison system, they call it recidivism. In North America, the average recidivism is like two and a half years for your felony criminals. They make it two and a half years on the outside and then they become repeat offenders. Now, some make it forever and some don't make it six months, but the average Chuck Colson began a special prison ministry, and um, he found that if they take Bible studies and turn to Christ, the um, recidivism goes from two and a half years to like 15 years, meaning they have a much better chance of making it on the outside if they come to Christ while they're in prison. That's why prison ministry is so important. But why would, so I heard about this guy. He went to a bank in California and he held up the bank and he said, I want $20. <laughs> and the teller said, what? He said, no, just give me 20. She gave him $20. He went and he sat down in the lobby and then the police arrived and they arrested him. They said, what's up? He said, you know, I've been free for six months. I don't know what to do with myself. All my friends are back in prison. I have no life out here. So I robbed a bank for $20 so he could go back. <laughs> because he was used to being locked up. Some people get so used to the life of sin, they don't know how to handle freedom. Do you know that there is a prison in South Korea where business people check themselves into the prison? 2013, they started this. You know, South Korea's got the longest work week of any country. They're very motivated, and it's just work, work, work. They also have a very high rate of suicide. 
and they found some people find more freedom in prison. And so they would pay to check themselves about a hundred bucks a day, you can go to jail. <laughs> they go to prison and they give them like a little yoga suit, no talking, they take away their electronic devices, they put them in a room, you know, with 115 square feet, no mirrors. And people say, oh, I feel so free. <laughs> because the rat race on the outside is so difficult, they check themselves into a prison. But you wonder, are we that different? We kind of like our prisons. The Bible story is a story of God saving people from the prison and bringing them to the palace. One of my favorites is the story of Joseph. I mean, here he is, the pampered son of a wealthy nomad, and he's falsely treated or he's betrayed by his brothers. And by the way, Joseph is sold for the price of a slave, like Jesus, for silver. Joseph, it was 20 pieces of silver. With Jesus, it was 30, because by the time of Christ, there was inflation. <laughs> and, but um, Judas is the one who suggested, or Judah is the one who suggested selling Joseph, and it was Judas who sold Jesus. There's a lot of parallels there. Anyway, you know the story. Becomes a slave, and he's faithful, and God blesses him, but then he's falsely accused as a slave. See, if, if you're living godly, it doesn't mean everything is going to go easy. You're going to meet with resistance. And then he's um, put in prison, and he tells the butler there, he says, just please remember me, and the butler forgets him. Until two years later, and the pharaoh has dreams. And the butler says, I remember my faults this day. There was a Hebrew in prison with me, and he had a gift for dreams. The pharaoh said, bring him. They brought Joseph out of the prison. It says he changed his garments and they shaved him. There's no sin in shaving. Joseph shaved. I've met some people that say it's a sin for men to shave. I just thought I'd throw that in there. I did a study on it. Okay. I did. I met a whole group of people that said you have to have a beard if you want to go to heaven. Anyone else meet those people? Yeah, they're out there. Yeah. Really, all kinds of... Anyway, back to my story. So, in one day, Joseph... He goes from the prison to the palace. He translates the king's dreams, and the king makes him the prime minister. What a radical change. Genesis 41, verse 41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen, and he put a gold chain around his neck. And he, meaning he had a, a seal for official documents. And he made him ride in the second chariot which he had. And he cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. And when he woke up that morning, he was in prison. At the end of the day, Egypt is bowing to him. And I don't know what Joseph did, but if it was me, I would have made several passes in front of Potiphar's house. <laughs> What about you? Come on, fess up. I would have waved to Mrs. Potiphar. And say, <laughs> I mean, it had to happen, right, at some point? God is good. And not only with Joseph, but have you ever thought David went, he had his prison to palace experience. I mean, even after Samuel anointed him king, David, that he had to run and hide and he was in a cave. He was living with the enemy. But then the day that Saul died, they sent emissaries to David, and they said, you know, God was with you. You used to lead us out in battle and never lose, and would you come be our king? And he went from cave to king. Just totally changed. Totally changed the situation. If you look in 2 Chronicles, and this is not all of them, friends. I'm just giving you some, what I think are some highlights of the story of Scripture. How God can radically change your life. Second Chronicles 33, verse 10. There was a king. He was probably one of the worst. I think Manasseh had his uh, black belt in being a wicked king. And he was the longest reigning king. It says, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people. And they would not listen. 
Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he was put in a dungeon in Babylon. When he was in affliction, he implored the, God, the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed to him, and he, God, received his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Manasseh went from the dungeon back to the palace because he humbled himself. He turned from his sin. I meet people and they say, Pastor Doug, you know, I knew better. I was raised in the church, and, and, but then I went sideways. I got into all kinds of trouble. I don't know how God could ever forgive me because I knew better. Well, Manasseh knew better too. His father was a great godly king. He was one of these prodigals that, I mean, he was worshiping idols and sacrificing children, and he killed the prophet Isaiah. I mean, he did a lot of despicable things, and he humbled himself and prayed, and God forgave him. And you think, wow, I, I, I tell you that story because if God can forgive Manasseh, he can forgive anybody. Paul thought he was the chief of sinners. I think he left Manasseh out. You know, Job describes this situation. The reason I throw this scripture in, this is a little bit of the meat of the word for you. Job was written years before, one of the oldest books in the Bible. He describes what happened to Manasseh. It's almost a prophetic statement. Look in the book of Job 36, verse 7. Speaking of the wicked, he says, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, or rather God does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings, for he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters, held in the cords of affliction, this is what happened to Manasseh, and he tells them their work and their transgressions, they're convicted of their sins, that they've acted defiantly. He also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. And if they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. They go from bound in fetters and cords of affliction to spending their days in prosperity. Why? When they turn. You know what the first message is that John the Baptist preached? Repent. You know what the first words Jesus said when he began preaching? Repent, the time is at hand, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't hear a lot about that these days, but that basically means turn. Repentance means you turn on the road of life. And Daniel, another fantastic example of someone going from the prison to the palace. I mean, Daniel was basically a captive from Judah, but he translates the king's dreams and he goes from that status to being the prime minister. It kind of happens with him twice. Because in another time, Daniel goes to the lion's den, and that's a prison if you ever had one. The seal is put on the door. He's condemned to a death sentence. It's dark, it stinks. And then the king moves the stone away and says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God who you serve deliver, been able to deliver you from the lions? And he brings him out and he makes him the prime minister of the Persian Empire from the prison to the palace. Now, you, why, why am I taking all this time to keep reiterating this point? Because this is the plan of salvation. The wicked are holden by the cords of their sins. You are either on your way to the promised land or you are a slave. You have either turned from your sin or you are still a captive. Jesus said, if you are not with him, you're against him. There are only two options. There are only two masters. One who wants to set you free. Jesus said, I am the truth. And then he says, the truth will set you free. Doesn't mean it's not going to be challenges along the way. There were challenges for the Israelites. There were challenges for Joseph. But it ends well. So the destiny, if you cling to your sin, is you die in the dungeon. But if, like Manasseh and others, you turn to God, he can take you from your prison to the palace. You know, God can so radically change your circumstances. I've seen it so many times in my life. I remember one day in particular when 
I was living in a cave. This is not the cave in Southern California. This was a cave outside of Covalo on the Black Butte River. Couldn't stand up, you'd hit your head. That's a, a little cave catching fish this big to eat them. Eating corn out of the fields because I was hungry. Reading in the book Steps of Christ that if a father hears the prayers of his children and uh, if they ask for bread, will he give them a stone? If they ask for a fish, will he give them a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will he give them a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask? And I prayed and said, Lord, can you turn this around? And in one day, I had a job, money, and a place to live. It's happened to me twice. I've gone from nothing, and then the Lord completely turned it around. You thought, how? You never would have guessed it would have happened. But I met somebody, and I got a job, and then they said, I have a place to stay, and when you come to our house for dinner, and I prayed that morning that God would turn it around, and he turned it all around in one day. How many of you heard stories like this? He can do it in practical ways. He can do it in financial ways. He can do it in relationships. Most importantly, he can do it in saving you from your sins. And one day, when you turn from your sins, and one day you can go from the prison to the palace. You can go from misery to joy. Your whole situation and circumstance can be transformed. The story of Esther. Again, you get, she's an, an orphan girl from a people who are captives. And uh, they're gonna actually, it's gonna ultimately be a death decree on her whole nation, living under a death decree. And through a strange series of circumstances, she's exalted to the position of queen and becomes a vehicle of saving the whole nation. And then Mordecai, they had built gallows to hang Mordecai. He went from someone who was going to be hanged on the gallows to being the prime minister. And the one who was going to hang him got hanged. And God can change your circumstances either way. He knows how to humble those who exalt themselves and exalt those who humble themselves. You see it all through the Bible, these wonderful stories. Now, and you see it when you go to the New Testament in the examples of the apostles. How many times were the apostles imprisoned and the Lord brought them out of prison? It happened with Peter and John. It happened with the 12 apostles. They put them, well, there was 11 of them at that. No, I guess there was 12 because it was after Acts chapter 2. They had replaced Judas. 12 apostles put in prison. An angel of the Lord appeared and said, go from this prison. You can read it in Acts 5, verse 18. The Pharisees laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. All right, now don't miss this point. How many of you want to get out of jail? And you ever play Monopoly? You know what I'm talking about. It was great if you got the get out of jail card. You set it aside, so I might need that. Well, if you're a believer, you need it. You need the get out of jail card. That's Jesus. Why does God get us out of jail? Why did the angel bring the apostles out of jail? He said, I want you to go and tell people the good news. I'll read it to you again. Angel said, go from the prison, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. That's the last word in Jeremiah. It's the last word the angel says. The words of life, because the prison is death. Psalm 142, verse 7, bring my soul out of prison. Why? That I might praise your name. Now, I'd like to suggest that if you get busy telling people about the Lord and what he's done for you, he'll keep you free. One of the best things to do if you want to stay close to God is tell other people about God. I'll admit that uh, one of the reasons I'm involved in evangelism is purely selfish. The more I'm engaged in studying the word and sharing with others, the more alive it stays in my own life. If you're just taking all the time you become stagnant. You know, there are two bodies of water in the land of Israel, very different. It's unique because both bodies of water, you get the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, are both supplied by the same river. 
Usually you've got uh, many rivers one to run to one ocean, but the Jordan is actually one river that feeds two oceans. The Sea of Galilee is full of life. The Dead Sea, as its name suggests, is dead. It has nothing alive in it. They're both supplied by the same river. Why is that? Because the Sea of Galilee not only takes the Jordan River at one end, but it gives at the other end. So it's constantly receiving a supply, but it's a channel, and the Jordan flows through it. Whereas the Dead Sea just takes it. And because it's so low and it evaporates so quickly, it never gives anything, and it's full of minerals and stagnant things, and, and there's not a polywog in the whole sea. Nothing lives in it. It's dead. If you just come to church to see what you're going to get once a week, you're probably not going to grow spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, you need to receive and give. We're not just talking about finances, though that's part of it. But you want to be a channel of blessings. You study the word and you share the word. You spend time in service and get involved in your church. You just don't go once a week. Everybody in a church should have some kind of role or small group or something they're involved in. Otherwise, you're spectators. And you'll land in prison again. Revelation 20, verse 6. They will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. They go from being prisoners to being priests. Why did Jesus come? To open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the prison. Those who sit in darkness from the prison house. What God did for Israel, he wants us to be doing for the lost. Amen? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have tried to break out of prison. But I have. I actually got into a high-speed chase with the police one time. That's another story. <laughs> they were chasing me. I didn't know they were police. It was a dangerous country. Well, now I'm getting into the story anyway. But... Um, when I was, uh, I was arrested uh, in Palm Springs, and I was underage, and they put me in a juvenile hall, and I was there for weeks. And, and while I was there, I was getting ready to make my break, and we had melted the plexiglass windows around the brackets because we had smuggled matches in. And it was just big enough for you to get through, but it was really tight. And the plan was to leave that night, and that day, they picked me up and sent me to New Mexico. Was all, I knew I'd get out. I was all ready to break out of prison. It's terrible. You ever been locked up? Don't raise your hands. But, uh, yeah, that's a, real, that's a real icebreaker in a church. Say, tell the other person how many times you've been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's an awful feeling when uh, once or twice, I've been in jail seven times. And I've been in jail many other times to visit. But, I mean, before I was a Christian, I wasn't visiting <laughs> And it's especially hard when you're by yourself and you're just sitting with nothing to do and it's miserable. And it feels so good when you walk out and there you see the world before you and you can go wherever you want to have that freedom again. There are people that are bound by the devil out there all around us and they're longing for freedom. You might think nobody wants to hear the gospel, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, the harvest is great. What's the problem? The laborers are few. He brings us out of prison so that we can go to the temple. They went from the prison to the palace and tell the good news about God. Not only did it happen with the apostles, you go to Acts 16, it happened with Paul and Silas. They're in prison, and in prison they say, well, if we're going to be in the darkness, we're going to be a witness here. So they, they're singing and praising God even in their darkness, and God sends an angel and a supernatural earthquake that opens all the prison doors. And Paul's preaching to his persecutor before the next day the jailer is baptized. As soon as his prison is open, he's telling other people how to be saved. One of my favorite stories is a story in Acts chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, turn there because we're going to read it. Acts chapter 12. And it's a story of Peter and his prison break. Peter escaped from a top security prison. Go to verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, I don't know if you realize how devastating that was, but Jesus had like a little inner trinity. 
that he took with him everywhere. They were with him in the garden on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. James was probably the older brother of John. And so now he was you know, something of a patriarch. He's been killed. And this is not very deep into, this is maybe uh, 10 years after or eight years after the cross. And uh, one of the leaders is gone. And then, because it made the Jews happy, it says he goes on and he arrests Peter. This is verse 3. He saw that it pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread, during the time of Passover. So when he arrested him, he put him in prison and he delivered him to four squads. That's uh, four times four. That's 16 soldiers. So you got King James that says four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. He's going to be brought before the people and executed. When it says when he was killed with a sword, that means they were beheaded, which is better than crucifixion, but that's, it plays into the story. So Peter is now in prison. James is dead. John is young. The church is in a real crisis. This is some of their core leadership. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. All right, now I want to look at both the literal and the spiritual side of this. What should the church be doing for those in prison? Peter is not only in prison, Peter is in prison on death row. Peter is not only in prison, Peter is in a prison where he's guarded by 16 soldiers. Why are they spending so much money guarding this unarmed fisherman? He's not a kung fu artist or anything. I mean, he's, he's got no reputation for, well, I guess he did take out a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he wasn't very good with it. Tried to chop off a guy's head and he got an ear. So why 16 soldiers? Because in Acts chapter 5, they had arrested these guys and they all got out. They don't know how they got out. So the religious leaders told Herod, you better watch him carefully. These guys are slippery. <laughs> and so he says, he won't get out. I'm going to put him in the innermost cell in the most securely guarded jail in this part of the Roman Empire. And I'll have 16 soldiers watching him 24 hours a day. And those soldiers know if he escapes, they die. He's not getting out. Furthermore, we're going to lock him in a door without wind, in a room without windows, and we will chain him on the right and the left to soldiers. As soon as Passover's over, we'll bring him out, make a public spectacle, we'll execute him. So you have the picture? What is the church doing for Peter? How often are they praying? Constantly. How should we be acting towards those that are on death row in prison? Pray for the lost. Not just in a general sense, but how many of you know lost people? How often should you pray? Now, I'm not talking about vain repetition, but if you've got children, you've prayed for them more than three times, haven't you? How long did Elijah pray for the rain? How often? Seven times, but actually he prayed until it came. He would have kept praying. So when you know something's God's will, just keep praying. The church made constant prayer to God for him. And when Herod was about to bring him out, verse 6, this is great. When Herod was about to bring him out, that night, when it says about to bring him out, what does that mean? The next day. That night, before he's going to be brought out and executed the next day, Peter is sleeping. What? What? He's sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. How well would you sleep between two Roman soldiers? <laughs> with chains. How well would you sleep knowing you're going to die the next day? So first of all, I've got to address this literally. Why is Peter asleep? How can he sleep? He's got a peace that passes understanding. He was not afraid. One reason he's not afraid is I think he knew he was not going to die. You know why? Jesus told Peter how he was going to die. It's in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. It says, when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands. Peter wasn't old yet. And this was not crucifixion. And Peter didn't know how, but he says, I don't think this is God's plan, so I'm not going to stay awake and worry about it. God's watching me. And he had completely surrendered. He was all in with the Lord. After Peter denied Jesus, he went and wept bitterly, and he was converted, and he had complete faith and trust. 
and he had courage and boldness. He said, when they said, do not preach in Jesus' name, he said, whether it's right in the sight of God to obey you more than God, you decide, but we ought to obey God rather than man. And he said, I'm not going to be quiet. You put me in prison for preaching. As soon as I get out, I'm going to preach again. So Peter's not afraid. But this also represents the lost. This represents people who are in prison. They're chained. No hope of escape. But the church is praying for them. What happens as a result of this, both for that situation and for Peter? Look in your Bibles, Acts chapter 12. Behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him and light shone in the prison. Can you say praise God? God sends light to the prison. In the short time I've been here, I've already met people who said, you know, we started watching these Amazing Facts programs and began to study, and now we're visiting the Adventist church. Can you say amen? amen. God sends a light to us. Jesus came into our world. He didn't say, if you, you know, get up to where I am, we'll talk. He brought the light into the world. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not overwhelm it or overcome it. God sends an angel. He sends a messenger. And the light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. You notice that the angel did not shake him gently and say, Shh, Peter, wake up. We got to get out of here. <laughs> the angel hits him. Any of you have a teenager that had trouble getting up? <laughs> One of our boys, the alarm would be ringing and the whole neighborhood's waking up and he wouldn't wake up. It's right by his head. He got used to sleeping with the alarm going off or hitting the snooze button. And uh, some people have done that with the Holy Spirit. They get so used to putting the snooze button on, they don't hear conviction anymore. And God has to smite us to wake us up. The angels struck him to wake him up. And Peter got up with a big start. And the angel said, arise quickly. It says, he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. He helps him up and says, arise quickly. How does God want us to come to him? Quickly. Now, Peter could have argued, it says the angel of the Lord. This might have been Gabriel. He could have said, Gabriel, I'd love to get up. But, you know, you can see I'm chained here between Tony and Mario. And uh, I, just, I can't get up. He could have argued. But as Peter made an effort to obey, what happened? The chains fell off. Now, if I don't get any further in this message, I don't want you to forget this point. It doesn't matter what your addiction is. It doesn't matter what your sin is. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Alcohol is a terrible addiction. I'm praying and working with a friend that's struggling with a, it's a terrible addiction. But how many of you know people that have been saved permanently from alcoholism? Now, they may always have that tendency, but they haven't had a drink. They live a sober life. Can he do it? Yeah. They say smoking is harder to quit than drinking. And now it's vaping. It's addicting. They say it's as bad as heroin. But how many of you know people that have... God breaks the chains. He can do it, whatever your sin is. By the way, if you don't have Jesus as the main focus in your life, then something else is your God. And everybody was designed by God to be addicted. And if we're not addicted to God, then the question is, what is it you're addicted to? Because it's something else. It may be money or work. Some it's sex and pornography. Some it's shopping and materialism. Clothes. Unhealthy codependent relationship. All kinds of things. The devil doesn't care what your particular brand of sin is, as long as he's got the chains on you. Jesus can break chains. The story of the Bible is that he can break the chains and set the captives free. And when Peter made the first effort to do what Jesus asked him to do, what happened? The chains fell off. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people that say, oh, Pastor Dyer, I struggled with this and I struggled with that for years and I prayed and then just the most amazing thing happened. God saved me. He took it away. I know people, you know, I believe in a smoking plan. You know, I used to do a five-day smoking plan and I believe in a five-minute 
smoking plan. It can be a five-minute drinking plan. It can be anything. What I tell them, I say, do you believe? I said, do you want to quit? Yeah. I said, all right. Do you believe God wants you to stop? Yes. Okay. You know, it says don't kill. That would include yourself. I said, will God help you do what he wants you to do? Will God ever command you to do something without giving you power to do it? It'd be mean for him to punish you for not doing what you have no power to do. Will God help you do what he wants you to do? Yes. I said, now, do you have any cigarettes in the house? Oh, they get quiet. I said, do you want to be free? I said, you take a step towards the Lord by making the first step. You draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That's a promise. Make your toilet an altar and flush your cigarettes. Don't throw them in the trash because you might dig them out later. I know I've been there. And they say, okay. I said, now let's kneel and pray. And we ask God to break the chains. And I've met people before that they just constantly were like chain smokers. And they came to me and they're almost giddy. They say, I don't understand it, Pastor Doug. I was expecting the worst. He said, I have no desire. It's gone. Now, I've heard that testimony with cigarettes. I've heard it with alcohol. I've heard it with all kinds of things. That doesn't mean you're never going to be tempted again. For me, it didn't happen that way. For me, it was a long, hard struggle. Praise the Lord, it's been 40 years. But I've seen him just break the chains. Ten men with leprosy came to Jesus, and Jesus said, they said, Son of David, have mercy on us. He said, go show yourself to the priests. They said, well, we're supposed to show ourselves to the priests to be inspected because we've been healed. We don't show ourselves to the priests if we still have leprosy. But they obeyed, and the Bible says, in going, they were cleansed. In the process of their taking steps to do what God had told them to do, a miracle happened. When you take some initiative, if you know what God's will is, and if you make an effort using your human strength to do what God is asking you to do, when he says repent of your sin, that means turn from your sin. And if you humanly do what you can to turn from your sin, he will give supernatural strength to support you as you are making an effort. If you walk down to the Red Sea and say, Lord, I don't see any way across, but I'm going forward, you watch what he does. God is in the business of moving mountains and parting oceans, friends, and breaking chains. Peter got up, and the angel, the chains fell off. He said, put on your coat and follow me. You begin a journey. Put on your shoes like the Passover. You begin a journey. Children of Israel began that journey to freedom. They put on their shoes. It's an adventure. And the doors began to open up. And I just, I can't wait to get to heaven and watch the video of this where Angel walks by all these, Peter walks by all the guards and he's going, and just, you know, they don't see him. And it says the main prison gate opened to them of its own accord. The angel has a garage door open there, it just opened it. And they went out. And you know where Peter went right after he got out of prison? To church. Where do you go when you've been saved from prison? Go to church. And you know what he did? He shared his testimony of how God saved him from prison and broke the chains. Best thing you can do to reinforce your deliverance is share it with somebody else. And it's funny, when Peter first gets here, he knocks on the door, and a girl named Rhoda comes to the door. She says, who's there? Peter. She says, yeah, we're having a prayer meeting for Peter right now, but the, the elders don't want to be interrupted. They're praying. And he goes, no, I'm Peter. She goes, Peter, no, no, Peter's in prison. And she can hear the elders and everyone gathered in the other room. They're going, oh, Lord, save your servant, Peter. We believe, deliver him. And he says, this is Peter. She sounds familiar. She goes back and she says, excuse me, we're praying. Lord, please save Peter. Deliver Peter, do something. She says, but wait, wait, what, what is it? Peter's at the door. You're crazy. <laughs> So that should encourage you because the church that Peter went to, they didn't have much faith, did they? They're praying without ceasing, but they said, well, here he is. So, oh, no. Must be his angel. I don't even know what that means. But I said some theology issues, too. But um, saves him from prison. He goes to church. He shares his testimony. Now, I just got to end with this. Herod, who starts that chapter on top of the world, he's in charge, he's destroying the church just like the devil. 
He calls for Peter to be executed. The guards are in a great turmoil. And finally, one of the guards whispers to somebody who whispers to Herod, and he says, uh, the prisoners escaped. <laughs> he goes, what? And the Sadducees and Pharisees said, we told you, these guys are slippery. <laughs> They're fishermen. <laughs> And Herod does an inquiry, and he executes the guards. And he is so mortified, he leaves town, goes down to Caesarea, and it says he's making a speech. And he's dressed in his royal apparel, and it's glittering in the sun, and the people are drunk, and says, it's the voice of a god and not of a man. And he takes a chest full of air and says, yes, I am pretty special. And that same angel of the Lord that smote me, Josephus mentions that, says he was eaten from the inside out by maggots. I mean, that's probably too graphic, sorry. <laughs> so in other words, the historian supports what the Bible says there. The angel smote Peter and he saved him to wake him up. But because of Herod's pride, he's smitten and he is consumed from the inside out like the devil. God wants to break your chains. He wants to set you free. The Lord hasn't changed. He wants to set you free so you, you can come to Jesus and then you go for Jesus. Amen? Amen? And I'd like to have a prayer with you before we close tonight and, and just ask, how many of you would like to say, oh, Lord, I want to be free. I want to be free indeed. I want you to break the chains. Is that your prayer? Loving Lord, we thank you for these uh, illustrations, both from history and from Scripture, that remind us that you are always a prayer away, that you can break the chains, you can take us from the prison to the palace, you can save us from the devil's dungeon and, and bring us into your glorious presence. Lord, I pray you'll do that for each person here. You know what the particular issues are they struggle with. I pray they'll make an effort now by your grace to draw close to you, break the chains, set them free, that they might sing your praises and be with us throughout this uh, entire camp meeting experience May we be all transformed and all in as a result. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I think there may be some closing announcements.